Warfare sometimes comes down to a duel between two commanders, Napoleon and Wellington, Lee and Grant. Our program looks at a battle in the First World War when American General John Pershing faced the German General Max von Gollwitz. Both men were brilliant commanders and both were looking for a victory to cap off their careers. Their showdown in 1918 was the last battle in what was then known as the War to End All Wars. Midnight, September 26th, 1918. On the Western Front in France, 2,700 guns of the U.S. First Army lit up the darkness. The ear-splitting fire began the U.S. offensive against the German bastion of Meuse-Argonne. German defenses were in a deeply wooded and hilly terrain in the formidable Argonne Forest. As daylight came, every caliber of U.S. artillery was still firing, devastating many German positions on the front line. Then the U.S. infantry went over the top, beginning the first full-scale U.S. action on the Western Front. But the Germans took maximum advantage of their defenses and fiercely resisted. The Meuse-Argonne battle brought together the U.S. Army Commander General John Blackjack Pershing, who still had much to learn about fighting on the Western Front, and the highly experienced German General Max von Gallwitz. It was a face-off destined to become an epic struggle. After nearly three years of deadlock on the Western Front, Allied morale was boosted in 1917. The U.S. declared war on Germany on April 6th in response to German aggression at sea and its attempts to stir up trouble in Mexico. President Woodrow Wilson told the American people they must keep the world safe for democracy. U.S. troops were sent to Europe soon after this commitment to the war, but it was a long time before America was ready for action. The U.S. needed trained soldiers and a military infrastructure to provide manpower and equipment on such a large scale. One of America's most experienced soldiers, General John Joseph Pershing, was appointed to command the U.S. Expeditionary Force. He arrived in France in June 1917. He quickly made it clear to his Allied counterparts that his army would only fight as a cohesive, all-American force. He would not commit to battle until his army's strength and equipment were reinforced. As a result, the U.S. Expeditionary Force did not play a significant role until September 1918. The Allies had gone on the offensive in August 1918 and were driving the German forces back. By September, three Allied army groups were poised to strike. The British in the north, the French, and Pershing's Americans, facing the Germans, the San Miguel Bulge, and the Argonne. The U.S. Army Group's first task was to eradicate the German Bulge at San Miguel which they did on September 12th. But after this, Pershing was faced with a more complex task. He 
he was ordered to clear the rugged, hilly terrain of the Argonne Forest. The battle-hardened German commander, Max von Galwitz, had been told to defend this sector to the last man. Both Pershing and Galwitz were combat veterans and men of iron wills. Success or failure at Meuse Argonne would be decided by their experience. Born in 1860, Pershing entered the U.S. Military Academy at West Point at age 18. He excelled as a student. His first combat experience was as a cavalry officer in the Indian Wars. His talent as a dashing junior leader marked him for early promotion. He then served as a squadron and regimental commander in the Philippines before leading the 10th Cavalry Regiment in Cuba, a black regiment, during the Spanish-American War. This earned him the nickname Blackjack. His work as an observer during the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 introduced him into influential circles in Washington. It paid off. In 1916, Pershing was chosen above more senior officers to command the U.S. Expeditionary Force in Mexico. There, he confronted the notorious bandit Pancho Villa and his renegades and defeated them. Pershing suffered a personal tragedy when his wife and three daughters died in a house fire. Afterward, he devoted himself entirely to his military career. His success in Mexico was rewarded when he was appointed commander of the U.S. Expeditionary Force on May 26, 1917. During his command, he was determined to command his own way. He wanted his troops in France to fight as an individual force, not as reinforcements for the British or French. Pershing resisted British and French attempts to subordinate his forces to them. Still, he did allow some of his troops to fight under Allied command during the 1918 German offensives in the spring and summer. The Americans fought next to their French and British colleagues with distinction. But Pershing was determined that the U.S. Expeditionary Force be recognized in its own right. He was about to get the opportunity to show that he and his men were worthy of it. Born in 1852, German General Max von Galwitz had a distinguished record of military and combat service. He joined the elite Prussian Guards in 1870. Von Galwitz made his mark as a fearless young officer during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. He commanded a guards division in 1914 and was soon given command of an army. Von Galwitz was only loyal to those he believed had Germany's best interests at heart. He despised the strategies of the former head of the German army, General Erich von Falkenhayn, and actively supported his removal. He supported the new command of Hindenburg and Ludendorff, based on their successes on the Eastern Front. Von Galwitz had brilliantly defeated the Russians in May 1915. Tsarist armies melted like snow before the relentless German advance. In the autumn of 1915, he was transferred to Verdun on the Western Front to command Army Group Meuse. Despite Galwitz's skill as a commander, his army suffered some 70,000 casualties during a two-mile advance in the spring and summer of 1916. 
But German losses at Verdun were nothing compared to the slaughter that followed at the Somme later that year. Despite the heavy losses he incurred, Galwitz's reputation remained high. He continued to command on the Western Front, principally against the British, until the 1918 German Spring Offensive. When this attack failed, he was given his own army group, Galwitz, to defend the vital Meuse-Argonne sector. Now, in September 1918, both Pershing and Galwitz prepared for the crucial battle at Meuse-Argonne. Between May 1917 and September 1918, U.S. forces in Europe increased from 127,000 men to over one million. Although their French and British allies regarded them as novices, American soldiers were fresh, fit, and confident they could finish the job against Germany. Even more important, America had a seemingly endless supply of manpower in contrast to the dwindling resources of the German army. Germany's leaders realized that unchecked, this influx of US troops would lead to Germany's defeat. German military leaders Erich Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg decided to launch an attack early in 1918. They wanted a victory before US forces became too strong. The German Army's massive spring offensive, which began on March 21, 1918, initially seemed able to achieve this objective. There were some spectacular successes between March and July 1918, but German casualties were so high that Germany's hopes for victory were dashed by mid-July. At the end of 1917 and beginning of 1918, the U.S. 1st Division, which included some elite U.S. Marines, led the American troops on the Western Front. The 1st Division fought during the German offensives against the French in the summer of 1918. Despite heroic efforts, the U.S. Marine Brigade suffered almost 2,000 casualties against the German defenses at Belleau Wood in June. When the German offensive broke down, the Allies went on the offensive. In August 1918, they began a series of rolling attacks to drive the Germans back. As one Allied offensive lost momentum, another would begin. This gave the Germans no time to reorganize. Allied Supreme Commander Ferdinand Foch ordered everyone to the fight, inspiring the Allies. Pershing's First Army began its initial independent action on September 12th. It successfully pushed back the German bulge at saint -Miel. Next came another challenge for Pershing. He was told to attack the Meuse-Argonne sector on September 26, 1918. Pershing had to break through the strong German defenses there and push on toward Sedan. This meant breaking through the impregnable Hindenburg line. The whole area sloped down to the valley of the River Meuse. It ran through Verdun, parallel to the River Aisne. The terrain was steep, thickly wooded, and challenging. It favored the defenders. Pershing had no choice but a frontal attack. Pershing's first move was to redeploy his forces from Samuel to the Argonne Front. In less than two weeks, 60,000 troops were transferred to the area. This rapid movement of men, weapons, and supplies depended on the organizational skills of Colonel George Marshall. 
he would eventually become the United States Chief of Staff and Secretary of State. At Meuse Argonne, 600,000 American and French troops would attack side by side. Pershing alone had 2,700 guns to support his advance. He was determined to take Galvez's defenders by surprise. He would launch the offensive with a short, concentrated bombardment before the main attack. He also had over 500 tanks, primarily Renault light tanks. Pershing knew the potential pitfalls of fighting with tanks in close quarters, but he believed that tanks could support his infantry and help it break through. One thousand U.S. and French aircraft would ensure air supremacy over the battlefield. But Germany's chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, was not ready to surrender Meuse Argonne. He told General Max von Galwitz to hold it at all costs. Galwitz planned to exploit Germany's defensive advantage. He made sure that the Meuse Argonne defenses included well positioned trench systems concrete bunkers, and deep dugouts. These were an impregnable obstacle to any Allied offensive. By late September 1918, four lines of German positions 14 miles deep faced the Americans at Meuse-Argonne. The most daunting was the Kriemhild line in the rear. Galwitz's combat engineers had also demolished most of the bridges over the River Meuse to delay Pershing's attack. By September 25th, General Max von Galwitz and Black Jack Pershing were ready for battle. Their plans and their men were prepared for the hour of destiny. U.S. soldiers in World War I were known as doughboys, a reference to the mud and dust-caked infantrymen of the Civil War. They arrived in Europe with little more than their personal weapons. They were equipped and trained for combat largely by the British and French. One weapon they learned to use was the French Hotchkiss machine gun. Another was the reliable and deadly British Vickers machine gun. The French supplied most of the artillery, including the quick-firing 75-millimeter field gun. The Americans had their own tank units, but they were largely equipped with French-built Renault light tanks. The Renault carried a crew of only two and was armed with a 37-millimeter gun. Its average speed was four miles per hour. It was relatively fast for its day, but lightly armored. It was vulnerable to German field artillery. The Doughboys were also given motorized transport, which helped them redeploy rapidly from Samuel. During the battles they fought earlier in 1918, the courage of Pershing's largely inexperienced men was a surprise to friend and foe alike. But by September of that year, Pershing's force had grown to one million men.
Pershing knew that no American general had commanded such a large force since the Civil War. And his army was a mix of experienced and inexperienced men. The U.S. regular soldiers and Marines now had combat experience. Some of the National Guardsmen had done military service prior to the war, especially in Mexico. But the men of the National Army Divisions had been drafted and had not seen fighting yet. Whatever their experience, the Doughboys had infectious enthusiasm that impressed their French mentors. The French also respected them for their courtesy to French civilians. Pershing's troops befriended French peasants and their children in villages behind the lines. They swapped candy for milk, fresh bread, eggs, and vegetables. However, the boredom of trench warfare frustrated U.S. troops. They wanted to win the war and go home. The small band of regular officers who would be the United States military leaders in the future thought the same. They were convinced the U.S. Army would come into its own once the war became more mobile. They were men like George Patton who quickly rose to command a tank brigade. Douglas MacArthur, who served in the famous 42nd Rainbow Division. And George Marshall, who had shown his prowess as a staff officer. Stern and humorless, Pershing was ruthless in dismissing ineffective subordinates, but his soldiers respected him for this. In late September 1918, every American officer and doughboy knew that the battle for Meuse Argonne would test their courage and skills. But they were still confident. On the other side, German troops were in trouble. Their losses continued to mount in these last months of the war. Their reinforcements were generally very young and hastily trained. But the German army was still an impressive fighting force. Many of the troops defending the Argonne sector had served here for a long time and knew it intimately. This gave them an advantage over their American opponents. Galvitz's soldiers had a fine record of junior leadership. Junior non-commissioned officers and soldiers took the initiative if their superiors were killed or wounded. The German infantry was well equipped. It had devastating Maxim machine guns and highly trained crews. It also had the mobile and accurate 77 millimeter field gun. Trench mortars too were deadly at close range and in close quarters. Headquarters and communication centers were well protected by strong dugouts. Telephone cables were buried deep, protected from artillery fire. Galvitz's commanders could keep in touch during battle and transfer reserves quickly to where they were most needed. 
The Germans also had an extensive railway network for resupply. But above all, the Germans had years of experience in defensive tactics. They would hold their fortified lines and make extensive use of counterattacks and artillery to ensure that they were not penetrated. Training in these tactics had made them experts. Experience also meant they could fight at night as well as by day. At the highest level, German troops regarded Max von Galwitz as a commander that they could trust. Now, on the eve of the great American assault at Meuse Argonne, both sides knew the sector was about to explode in the smoke and fire of battle. General Blackjack Pershing and General Max von Galwitz were about to face the greatest challenge of their careers. At midnight on Thursday, September 26, 1918, Pershing's 2,700 guns fired their first massive artillery bombardment. It lasted for four hours, stunning the German defenders of Meuse Argonne. Shortly after dawn, the U.S. infantry stormed across no man's land, supported by artillery fire. Overhead, swarms of Allied aircraft flew over the German lines, bombing and strafing at will. The Meuse-Argonne offensive of World War I had begun. Most of the German defenders survived the American barrage. They now rose from their dugouts to meet the onslaught. But the German general, von Galwitz, was concerned this attack might only be a diversion. The strength of Pershing's assault soon made Galwitz change his mind. He ordered his troops to counterattack. The German Supreme Commander, Erich Ludendorff, promised Galwitz reinforcements. But Pershing's plan did seem to be working. His men were making progress through the heavily wooded battlefield. By the end of the first day, they had advanced almost three miles in places. But German resistance then hardened and their defense tactics were initiated. German machine guns began to cause havoc among Pershing's doughboys. Carefully placed German defenses combined with the steep and densely wooded countryside began to slow the American attack. Pershing's men became disoriented. Cooperation between U.S. tanks and infantry was becoming impossible. As the tanks attacked German bunkers and trenches, they became more vulnerable to the German artillery. Allied guns kept pounding von Galwitz's defenses, but U.S. soldiers were now intermingled with the German defenders. Pershing's army also had resupply problems, caused in part by the difficult landscape and muddy conditions. In many places, U.S. troops were forced to protect themselves against increasingly heavy German artillery fire. Command and control continued to prove difficult for the U.S. staff in the forward zones. 
The German infantry held the line with grim determination. As Galvitz predicted, his men began to exact a terrible toll on Pershing's green troops. The inexperienced American staff officers began to make mistakes. Food and ammunition supplies failed to reach soldiers on the front line, and reinforcements lost their way. After five days of intense fighting, Pershing's men had advanced eight miles, but the German defenses had not been broken. The reputation of Pershing and his U.S. Army were being torn to shreds by Max von Galwitz. Their offensive against Meuse-Argonne, which had begun with such promise, was faltering. Casualties were mounting. In contrast, the French and British offensives were proving successful. The Americans continued to claw their way forward, but the German troops were conducting a highly coordinated defense. Pershing's men paid dearly for every yard they gained. The pressure on Blackjack Pershing to make progress increased by the day. Allied Supreme Commander Marshal Foch even proposed that Pershing's army be transferred to the French Fourth Army, effectively removing Pershing from command. If this happened, the U.S. Army's reputation would be tarnished. Pershing had to do something, and fast. At the beginning of October 1918, Pershing desperately regrouped his forces in an effort to break the stalemate with the Germans at Meuse-Argonne. Determined to hold on to his command, Pershing told Allied Commander Foch that his men would be ready to attack again on October 4th. Luckily, the weather was good. Pershing reorganized his forces and was ready to renew his offensive. But Galwitz had not been idle during this pause in the battle. He brought in supplies and reinforcements to strengthen defenses along the already powerful Kriemhild line. When the Americans attacked again on October 4th, there was no preliminary bombardment. But von Galwitz's men were ready. As a result, Pershing's troops made only slow progress. The list of casualties grew. But on October 7th, the 82nd American Division attacked the enemy line from the west, surprising the German defenders and forcing them to fall back. This eased the pressure on two other attacking divisions. In the mud and blood of the Argonne, U.S. soldiers were beginning to learn and adapt. A prime example was Sergeant Alvin York, a Tennessee woodsman before the war. He was also a marksman. Faced by a wave of cautiously advancing German infantry, he used his hunting skills to pick off advancing Germans while they were still far away. He shot 25 enemy soldiers before the others took cover.
After an hour of continued sniping and bombing on both sides, York was still unhurt. Another huge line of German assault troops appeared. But instead of attacking, the Germans surrendered. By the end of this very personal battle, Alvin York had taken 135 prisoners and knocked out or captured 35 German machine guns. This remarkable feat made him a national hero. Alvin York was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his bravery. Inspired by deeds like this, Pershing's men clawed their way forward despite heavy casualties. By October 12th, they were close to assaulting the last bastion of Galvitz's defense. This was the core of the Kriemhild Line, situated on dominant ridge line. The cornerstone of these defenses were strategically placed concrete blockhouses. From these, the Germans engaged the U.S. infantry and tanks as they struggled up the slope toward them. One by one, the blockhouses were taken. More American reinforcements moved up to maintain the offensive's momentum. It seemed only a matter of time before Galvitz's defenses cracked. Pershing began to sense that victory was in sight. The final assault on the Kriemhild line began on October 14th. For three days and nights, the struggle continued between the gallant doughboys and the resolute German defenders. With increased fire support, U.S. troops began making headway. German defenses began to buckle. Galvitz's troops manned the parapets time and again to stem Pershing's attacks. Despite inflicting casualties with their machine guns, the Germans were overwhelmed. The doughboys began to clear the Cream Hill line. On October 16th, Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the 83rd Brigade of the U.S. 42nd Rainbow Division, captured one of the last German fortifications, the Germans began to surrender in droves. The Kriemhild line was finally in American hands. Pershing reached the line he had planned to capture almost a month before. He now advanced on Sedan, France. The only thing left to do was finish the operation. The titanic struggle had cost the army group of Max von Galwitz 80,000 men who were killed, wounded, or taken prisoners. But the American success had a high price too. During the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, there were 117,000 U.S. casualties, almost 40% of the total American losses during the war.
Pershing's men took a much needed rest. They did not rejoin Allied operations until the end of October. When they returned, they made a significant contribution to the final Allied offensives, culminating in the armistice on November 11th. The war was finally over. Pershing felt his troops contributed significantly to the Allied victory. His doughboys had fought with great courage. They ultimately cracked the final bastion of German resistance, despite their heavy sacrifice. Pershing cemented the reputation of the American fighting man as a military equal. His troops had beaten a determined and well-led enemy. Pershing returned to the United States a hero. He became a five-star general and was appointed to the newly established rank of General of Armies. His career flourished. He became U.S. Secretary of State and an advisor on military matters. He maintained a deep interest in the later careers of his talented officers, MacArthur, Marshall, and Patton. After his retirement, Pershing lived quietly until his death in 1948. But German General Max von Galwitz ended his military career soon after the armistice. At age 69, he went into politics. He assisted his mentor, Paul von Hindenburg, in rebuilding Germany under the Weimar Republic. Like Hindenburg, he had no time for Hitler and the Nazi party. He was convinced that the Austrian corporal would lead Germany to disaster. Galwitz spent his final years writing his memoirs and a history of the Prussian guards. He died two weeks before his 85th birthday in 1937. General Black Jack Pershing's victory at Meuse Argonne later inspired U.S. troops during World War II. For General Max von Galwitz, the battle exemplified the skill and courage of a well-led German force. It was a legacy German troops would be reminded of just over 20 years later. The World War I battle at Meuse Argonne was a classic face-off between two determined generals. It had been a duel of nerve and resilience in which neither man bent to the will of the other. Today, it's hard to comprehend General Pershing's status as a national hero. After his death in 1948, a funeral procession carried his body from the Capitol in Washington to Arlington Cemetery. The crowd lining the route that hot July day was estimated at 300,000. When a thunderstorm hit, Generals Dwight Eisenhower and Omar Bradley were offered a ride in the limousine. They declined. For Black Jack Pershing, Bradley said, it would be proper if we walked in the rain. 